This is Jim Venitis from Hewlett Packard's uh, Sustainability and Social Innovation Office. I'm uh, very privileged to introduce the next uh, keynote speaker, Ramji Raghavan. Um, through the work that we're doing with the HP Catalyst Initiative and working with educators around the world, we've had the privilege of working with Ramji's organization, the Agastya International Foundation. And it's um, uh, terrific that he's uh, taken the time here to uh, share his story. Um, and I won't take any thunder from your story, Ramji, other to say that uh, every time I hear you speak, I'm inspired by what you do and the impact that you're having on millions of students in India, and also the impact that you're having beyond. So um, we're so glad you're here. And before we get going, though, um, we want to say a word of thanks to everyone that's making the uh, STEMXCon possible, the sponsors and, and the uh, supporters who are getting the word out. And so you know, events like this don't happen magically. They happen because a lot of people come to the table, including the um, the creators of the Global Education Conference, uh, Lucy Gray and Steve Hargadon, who are the masterminds behind making this similar kind of conference come alive. Just one of those few chances where you could have people from around the world sharing their perspective and their experience together. So thank you, everybody. Um, we thought we'd start here, too, with just uh, getting a, an idea of um, uh, who's in the audience. Um, so if you could grab, there's a little star tool in the to the left of the map, click on it twice, and then place your star on the map. You can let people know uh, where you're located right now. I'm in Silicon Valley here in uh, in California, um, and uh, there's just a few of us here. But uh, if you can indicate where you where you're hailing from, it'd be just we're just curious uh, what kind of audience we have here. A big old star. Yeah, there's a little star tool. It's right be below the pointer tool. Um, you just click twice on the star, and then you can place it on the map. Fantastic. We have Canada, North America. Some of you, uh, it's getting late there in uh, North America. And Ramji, I think it's uh, what, 8.30 a.m. your time in India? Yeah, around 8.30. Fantastic. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you all for letting us know where you are. Um, and the, the, this is a small group. Feel free to add uh, questions in the chat bar. And actually, we're small enough. Um, Steve, I think we can give people permission to speak directly to. They could raise their hands, and you can give them microphone privileges. Is that correct? Absolutely. OK. So. Um, Ramji, it's my great pleasure to, to have you here to, to speak. Why don't you um, uh, go ahead and tell us your story. OK, thank you, Jim. Likewise, uh, great pleasure, honor to be able to talk to all of you. Let me start with a story. This is a story about a girl, Pavitra, and a boy, Saina, about 13, 14 years old, poor kids. Uh, living in North Karnataka in southern India. And they used to go home every year for their holidays to their village. And they would see these mountains of groundnut shells piled up. Nothing ever happened except one time they began to think about it. And they asked the question, you know, can these groundnut shells, instead of causing sort of physical pollution all over, be used to create something useful? And they thought of the idea of making a paper out of it. And so they came up with a little formula and experimented, and it didn't work very well. And they realized they needed something, a kind of gluey thing, to keep these uh, uh, various elements together. And the boy, Sai, happened to watch his grandmother boil uh, okra. You know, okra is a very popular dish in southern India. And he found that it left behind uh, gluey residue. And that was his aha moment. And they used that gluey residue or a variant of it to produce paper out of groundnut shells. And one of our sponsors, the Dej Pandey Foundation, actually made a film on these two kids and put it up on YouTube. And an entrepreneur in North Karnataka was inspired enough by the film to call me and ask me if the kids would be willing to share their formula 
because he was interested in actually commercializing it. And he's in the process of uh, making a low-cost machine that he wants to distribute to households all across villages in North Karnataka for the housewife to sit down and actually churn paper out of these ground-up shells and, you know, uh, add to their living and income. Uh, what's, what's the value of this story to you and to me and to all of us is that I think it brings out the value of curiosity, the spirit of inquiry, the magic of wonder, the power of passion, staying with the problem. In fact, Einstein attributed his uh, earth-shattering insights to three things, curiosity, obsession, and dogged endurance. So the mission of Augustia, the foundation that I had, is to spark curiosity and nurture creativity, and yet also instill confidence among economically disadvantaged kids and government school teachers for the most part across India. And we're doing this working with a million or slightly more than a million children every year through 75 mobile science labs, 31 satellite science centers, and a 172-acre campus that we call our creativity lab which is located about two hours by road from Bangalore. So how did we get here? And we're a team of nearly 500 people today and perhaps the largest hands-on mobile science education program of its kind in the world. <clears throat> so how did we get here? When I came back to India about 12, 13 years ago, I had this dream of building a school that would nurture creative leaders in the foothills of the Himalayas. It sounded like a very a uh, noble thing to do, a wonderful thing to do, aesthetically very pleasing and all the rest of it. So I got a group of people, about 20 people together in a room, and this was back in 1999. And among them was my father, who had chaired a number of uh, engineering and technology companies in India, the former chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, a scientist, a few educators, some college kids, a few school kids, and even people from industry. And I went around the group asking the question, look, is it possible to raise the speed limit of creativity in the country? And if it is, how would one even go about doing it? And is the school idea something that makes sense to everyone? The reason I asked these questions was because I had no previous background in this whole domain. I was a banker living in London, leading a very different sort of lifestyle, a very transactional lifestyle, if you like. And I was now entering a field that required a lot of strategic thinking, long-term thinking, a lot of complexity dealing with people from different walks of life, and so on. And we talked about, okay, in order to answer this question, let's try and figure out what makes a person creative or innovative or a great problem solver. And we came up with four or five uh, aspects to this whole creative behavior uh, element. And we said, look, creative people, very good problem solvers, tend to be great observers. Somehow they're able to see a lot more in a situation than the average person does. Why? Well, there's a whole literature on that. But perhaps it has something to do with their natural interest, their curiosity, and the fact that they may be suspending judgment, not leaping to conclusions too quickly. So they allow different stimuli to happen in their brains and then something new happens, comes out of all that. So they're great observers. The second thing is there's this whole process of awareness. Because they allow uh, stimuli to gestate for a while in their brains, uh, there's, there's a whole pro process of awareness that begins to enrich the quality of ideas that emerge from this observation. The third element we said was they're able to integrate, assimilate, associate different strands of information, which means obviously they're open to a lot of different stimuli and getting lots of different knowledge from lots of different areas to uh, produce new things, synthesize new ideas or crystallize new ideas. And finally, Finally, they're very good at applying all of this to create something of value for society. So we have the great examples in, in science 
all over the world in the arts, the humanities, of how this process works. And Pavitra and Sainath are just a simple, humble example of how all of this actually happened, the observation, the awareness, the assimilation, and the application. So we said, look, this should be our model. This is really what we're talking about. But all of this is predicated on curiosity. If you're not curious, and if you're not motivated to be curious, you don't have the desire to want to find out, then, you know, none of this is going to happen, or it's not going to happen with the intensity and scale that you'd like to see it happen. So we said, let the mission of Augustia be to spark curiosity, and over time nurture creativity, because creativity is more of an outcome or uh, perhaps a more complex process. And motivation becomes critical. So we said instilling confidence, there's a lot of fear in the system. Uh, children are afraid to ask questions. So unless there's a sense of confidence and some element of self-belief, you won't even get out of bed, you won't even get out of your chair to experiment and explore and do all these wonderful things. So that became our model. The next question was, look, uh, somebody said, Ramji, you know, we're very impressed with their idea of creating the school, but is that what India needs? Uh, might we not end up just producing outstanding elite thinkers, uh, most of whom leave the country and go off to the U.S. or wherever? And is that really the purpose? So we thought about it and we sort of concluded and we said, look, you know, to use an analogy, we said, uh, raising the level of the ocean that's 100, 200 million children, even by a millimeter, perhaps would make more sense than creating 100 or 200 or 300 uh, elite thinkers. Because the system in India, we felt, was being let down not so much by the fact that India didn't have very bright, smart, creative people, but that the average person uh, was bereft of what the scientist, the atomic energy chairman called basic cause-effect thinking. People were unable to understand the consequences of their actions. And that is not something that necessarily comes naturally to someone. It can be learned. So the other question was, these skills we talk about, observation, awareness, association, application, can these skills be learned? And we concluded, yes, they can be learned. You might not produce an Einstein or a Ramanujan or a Feynman, but on a scale of 0 to 10, if you were at 1, in terms of overall creativity, perhaps we could move the scale up to 2 or 3 or 4. And if you did that across a wide spectrum of society, you'd see a grassroots transformation in the country. And that was very exciting. This is about the same time that I read a letter from Peter Drucker to... Uh, uh, a gentleman in Japan who, I can't remember his name, but a famous guy who was known as the Sam Walton of Japan. And they talk about uh, creativity in Japan versus creativity in the West and so on and so forth. And Drucker, in a very insightful letter, says, look, the transformation of Japan happened in the late 19th century and it's attributed to a transformation in governance what's known as the Meiji Restoration. But actually what people don't realize is that 150 years before Meiji came on, came, uh, on board, there was a group called the Bunjin that went about the literati of Japan, that went about spreading the equivalent of modern education in Japan, art, um, origami, and medicine, and mathematics. And they had, if you like, fertilized the soil the soil of the mind was very spongy and receptive and ready. So when governance became very positive through the Meiji Restoration, the grassroots, the ground could absorb all the positive stimuli that were now being provided. Right? So it was a sort of double positive. And that was a huge insight because what that told me was that in India what we need, and certainly we need better governance, there's no doubt about that, but what we also need is to create greater absorptive capacity at the grassroots. So today, if you go and say, I've got $100 million and I'd like to spend it in a village, you don't find too many takers because you don't have ideas, you don't have projects, the whole ecosystem is missing. You know, 
take, take California, Jim, where you're from, and there's such an incredible ecosystem that it can absorb all the new ideas and money and resources that you would pump into it. Now, that's not the case in a lot of uh, areas in India and many parts of the world. So increasing that absorptive capacity, using the analogy of soil, increasing the organic content of the soil becomes critical. And in the case of the human mind, it's about being curious, being open-minded, being able to think about the consequences of your actions, being willing to experiment and so on and so forth. So we said, okay, this is what we should really focus on at a mass level. So I sort of threw out the old idea of creating this Taj Mahal school and said, instead, let's build a school for schools, a laboratory for schools. So almost the first thing we did was to go and buy a couple of hundred acres of land, wasteland, not too far from Bangalore. Because we felt, you know, uh, let's sort of anchor our institution there. We need some kind of backbone for this. And so, in a way, we took a traditional approach by saying we need a campus. Uh, we got the land, and that was the good news. The bad news was that we began to run out of money. Uh, I had been living on capital and funding it in the early years myself. So the big question now was, how are we going to interest others to come in and put their money and help fund this uh, grand idea that we had? And money wasn't forthcoming that easily at that time, uh, to around 2000, when the world went through the dot-com bust. So we had to come up with some better idea. And certainly one of the things we were good at then, and I think we still are today, was to sit down and, and think through new ideas. So we sat down and then we said, hey, you know, maybe we've got this wrong. It's not about building buildings and waiting for children and teachers to come to your campus. Maybe we should reverse the flow. Maybe we should go out and take education out to the villages. How would we do that? The idea of a mobile lab uh, emerged from that. And we said, okay, uh, let's get a vehicle. A friend of mine loaned a second-hand vehicle from an auto company. The chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission arranged for uh, a science institute in Mumbai to gift us a box full of low-cost science experiments costing all of $10 or something at the time. Um, you know, with uh, candles, candles and uh, balls of string and discarded plastic mineral water bottles, uh, things like that, through which you could demonstrate a lot of very interesting science experiments very effectively. And we trained our campus tractor driver, Balram, to be our first mobile lab instructor and set him loose in the villages. A few weeks went by and I asked Balram, how's it going, Balram? And he said, fantastic. They love it. The children have never seen anything like it. Initially, they would run away thinking I was a missionary or something. But then they came flocking back. Uh, they loved it. And, you know, I never realized that teaching could be so much fun. So we said, well, this is what it's all about. It's about interactive, hands-on type of learning. And about that time, I read a book, I uh, forget the name of the author, who quoted a study uh, in the U.S. or somewhere, saying that... Uh, the, the cognitive scientists had found that the human brain on average retains no more than 5% of a lecture, about 10% of what it reads. About 50% of what you see and hear, 70% of what you experience, and over 90% of what you teach to others. So we said, okay, the education system is somewhat lopsided, favoring the chalk and talk model and at best, a uh, certain amount of reading, uh, the education system for the poor, that is, the rural poor. And perhaps that's not an area where we can add much value, but through these mobile science labs, we will inject the creative spark, the, the motivation to be curious, to experiential hands-on learning. And uh, so I said, you know, keep running the mobile lab till we come up with a better idea of more money. Now, the mobile lab became an instrument uh, for our next project at scale, which was the Village Science Fair. And here again, we hit upon a new idea uh, out of necessity, a sort of battlefield innovation. We had this, again, a traditional model. We said, here are all the science experiments. Let's get a bunch of teachers from the schools, uh, train them to teach these experiments to visiting children. And uh, that was great, and we were all set to go, expecting about 500 uh, kids to show up. 
when we were told to our horror to expect not 500 but 5,000 kids. Uh, the word had spread around the villages and people were excited and curious about what we were doing. So we said, now how are we going to handle this volume? The teachers, the number of teachers available was just not enough. So a couple of girls happened to hear that we had this dilemma and they walked up to us and said, look, you don't have enough teachers, right? Right. Now, what if you could train us to teach these experiments, us and our friends? And at first we thought that was a terrible idea because how could we teach them and they, they might not be as effective as, as a regular teacher. But we had no option, so we went with it and trained about 100 of these kids, 13, 14 years old, kids like Pagatra and Sai. And uh, the science fair turned out to be a huge success, not least because the visiting kids saw people just like themselves, other young kids with big smiles standing behind the tables, dying to teach them science and perhaps even show off a little bit. And that's when we realized that, look, this peer-to-peer -peer teaching model is really powerful. And where you have a problem in finding enough teachers, there's a shortage of teachers, there's a shortage of uh, quality teachers, a uh, shortage of teachers that are motivated to try out new things, how about if we work with these older kids and make them our, if you like, teaching force? And that gave birth to what we call our Young Instructor Leader Program, where we teach children to teach children, engage them in community projects, uh, put them through a fairly intensive program. And these are the kids who've been winning the Intel Iris Science Award at the national level for five years in a row. Kids of carpenters, small uh, farmers, construction workers, kids who you would never imagine uh, would be able to compete for anything at any level have been winning awards at the national level. And they've come up with a lot of projects, interestingly, to do with ecology and their environment. Projects like the cooling effect of leaves. What's the most effective plant or shrub to grow on highways uh, to produce more oxygen to offset highway pollution? Uh, you know, organic shoe polish. And what color of uh, candlestick actually uh, produces the best light and, you know, simple things that you wouldn't even think about uh, they've been doing in space. So, with this creativity model, with our mobile science labs, we thought, okay, we've developed or run into a sort of outreach model that seems to be quite effective. Now, the mobile lab is a very seductive thing. People love it and we've got 75 of them zipping around the countryside across India. But the problem with the mobile lab is that it's mobile. So what we said was, look, you know, we need to strengthen this. And we created these satellite science centers. So we said, okay, this is what our outreach model is going to be. It, we call it our hub and spoke model. The science center becomes a hub, uh, has two, three hundred different interesting science experiments. Children and teachers can come there, do projects, activity-based learning. We train teachers. And there's a certain stability and a repetition of visits and so on and so forth. But not everyone can come there because not everyone has access to a bus or a car or whatever, or may not even have money, even if the access is there to pay for a bus ticket. So that's where the mobile labs become the spokes and take this hands-on experiential fund learning to the countryside, to remote areas. So we said, okay, this is the hub and spoke model and let's go for it. Meanwhile, funding began to trickle into our campus and we began to build uh, some interesting uh, interactive science centers. We'd find somebody, a guy from a local shepherd community that had built a very interesting model of the solar system. Uh, really impressive. And we said, all right, why don't you build a few of those for us? So we began to find that there were a lot of unsung heroes, creative people out there in the countryside who had no platform. Uh, who had no avenue to express their creativity and get some credit for it. So we said, all right, we'll give you that platform to do that. So slowly the campus began to grow. And today we've got a handful of very interesting science centers. I visited the Exploratorium about 10 years ago. I was very inspired by it, and that led to us building an interactive science center um, that we call our Discovery Center on campus 
We've got a new astronomy center with the, I think, the world's largest suspended planetary system. It's about 36 feet in diameter. And uh, the other area where we've made some impact is in the whole area of ecology and eco-restoration. Remember, this was a wasteland, rocky wasteland, where uh, nothing grew, it had been overgrazed. So I invited a few uh, environmentalists and they analyzed the soil and said, you know, actually it's very interesting. There are three different types of soil that meet on your campus because it's at the tri-junction of three states. And anything we do here, in a sense it's unique, but anything we do here can be replicated across peninsular India. So they started regenerating the land through a strategy they call gentle manipulation protecting the land, seeing what it was capable of, uh, fostering endemic species, and all the rest of it. And today, I think that land, which was wasteland, has been converted into a kind of medicinal park. India is very famous for some very ancient herbal and medicinal traditions. So we grow a lot of those plants and herbs. And we then use the mobile lab system to propagate this in a, in, in a radius of about 50 kilometers. So we have a mobile ecology lab that goes about distributing saplings to the villages at night. So ecology became an important element of what we were doing. So we had this campus, we had the science centers, we had the mobile labs, and then we said, okay, we think we have the backbone for what we call an ecosystem for hands-on science education. And uh, we should try and find a way of getting this scaled up and replicated. In 2008, I was invited by the Prime Minister's Knowledge Commission to make a presentation on how this could be scaled up. And there's a PPT slide. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, we can see Hello. it. They can see it? All right. Okay. So you can see the Creativity Lab is our big campus. This, we've inserted a new uh, intermediate layer called the science activity centers. It's just, you know, it varies in terms of size from the mini science centers, then the mobile labs, and now we have something called lab in a box and lab on a bike. And uh, the numbers on the right hand side tell you the number of such uh, centers that we think if India were in a position to invest in, we could pretty much cover the whole of India and perhaps a uh, target audience of 150 or 200 million children. So this is roughly, minus a lab in a box and lab on a bike, what I presented to the Knowledge Commission, and they recommended to the Prime Minister that we ought to do this. Well, nothing happened, and that's not surprising sometimes when you're dealing with uh, the government. They have so many priorities and so on. But the state government of Karnataka, where I operate, where Auguste operates, came forward and said, you know, this is really interesting. We'd like to create this ecosystem in, this, in the state. So we are in the process of building all this out. And uh, by the middle of next year, we think we'll have 90% of it running. We already run the mobile labs and many science centers. So what we're doing now really is building the science activity centers and the uh, creativity lab for Karnataka. A few other state governments have also indicated interest. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping that this model of aspects of it uh, begins to get replicated across the country. Now, in terms of impact, you know, I have, we, we are creating a book of case stories of hundreds of children, perhaps even a few thousand, uh, who've been fairly deeply impacted. We commissioned two studies. Uh, one was actually commissioned not by us, but by the government of India, because they said, you know, we are paying Augustia all this money. Uh, they fund our operating expenses for some of these outreach programs. So let's go and find out if, you know, our money is being well spent. And so they commissioned uh, uh, an organization in Delhi to do a study. And uh, I'm happy to share the results of that study. It's more of a qualitative study. But the feedback that came out of it is that, yes, indeed, there are numerous examples of how this whole thing has motivated children to go to school, uh, got them to be more curious. In fact, they said at the village level, they found the kind of 
last, the, the kind of interaction that parents have had with their children has gone through a change. You know, earlier children would not even talk about what they were learning at school with their parents. But that has changed. Uh, the fact that uh, many people believe that children's uh, grades in schools have gone up. Many of them now aspire to things they would never have dreamt of aspiring to. So on the whole, fairly positive, very positive, with some recommendations centering on the need to actually increase the intensity of this uh, and drill it down uh, to lower and lower levels. You see the word taluk there. That is sort of, uh, you know, each district has several taluks. And one of the recommendations was that we need to have these centers in each, each taluk. It wasn't enough to have it just in a district. The second study that we commissioned by the Best Practices Foundation, Best Practices looked at our objectives. And they said, look, you, you seem to be embarked on creating four or five behavioral changes, which are, the first one is to bring about a shift from yes to why. It's too much yesing in the system. We need more whying, if you like. The second is from looking to observe. The third is from being very passive to learning to explore. The fourth is from being very textbook to being more hands-on. And finally, the shift from fear to confidence. So let's go and interview, like, I think they've looked at a couple of thousand kids and a few hundred teachers to see what impact you're having. And they came back and said, look, at the level of awareness, awareness that there is a new way of learning that is more interesting, that's more productive, and motivation, we think almost 100% of the children have gone through a positive change. In terms of curiosity, they differentiated routine curiosity from what they call epistemic curiosity. And they said, uh, compared to the control group, Augustia kids certainly exhibited much higher levels of epistemic curiosity. About 65% of the kids they interviewed seemed to show that uh, behavioral change. In terms of creativity, which is a very broad area, they focused more on hands-on, model making, things like that, and said, we think about 35% of the children you've worked with have been positively impacted, directly. Now, the other two areas they looked at were problem solving and leadership skills. And they focused more on the young instructor leaders and said, look, here's where you're having huge transformation. Uh, the young instructor leaders have shown a massive improvement in problem solving skills and certainly most of them have shown through their work in communities and the sorts of initiatives they've taken to uh, do new projects, uh, very impressive levels of leadership. So again, uh, music to my ears, uh, could it have been better possibly? Uh, does the program need to intensify? Yes, and that depends on budgets. And that's one reason why we said, look, if a mobile lab is a little expensive to operate, let's scale it down. And so we created a lab in a box, and now a lab on a bike. Because in a mobile lab, you're paying for a driver. In India, the teachers don't drive. And, and we discovered that the reason they don't want to drive is when they go into a village, uh, they lose status, they lose space. You know, people think, ah, this guy is a driver. Uh, what can he teach me? Well, that's the reality of it. So the driver is sort of uh, semi-employed, if you like, not fully utilized. So we said, all right, how about uh, creating this lab on a bike where the status issue doesn't uh, turn out to be a negative, it's actually a positive. The guy looks pretty cool uh, riding a bicycle. And he also teaches. So we save money, it's more focused, and we could conceivably have a couple of hundred such uh, lab on a bike. So uh, we're looking for new ways of scaling down things, scaling up things, uh, finding ways of lowering the cost per exposure. We monitor the cost per exposure for each of these interventions. Uh, we look for publicity. We look for ways that government authorities can hear about what we're doing and incentivize them to, to uh, scale up and replicate. So one of the things, models we're looking at and which, we are, which we've actually implemented is what in India we call the public-private partnership, PPP model. So uh, we go to the government and say, you know, we think you need to launch like 30 mobile science labs in your state and we'd be prepared to fund the capital cost of 
maybe five or ten of them. And you'll have to absorb the capital costs of the remaining mobile labs and underwrite 100% of the operating costs. And that has been a fairly effective model because what it tells the government is, here's an organization that's prepared to, you know, invest their own money. They're not just coming here and thinking they're getting a free lunch. So these are challenges that we have to work with uh, literally on a daily basis, but it's well worth the effort. And uh, yesterday somebody was telling me, the head of an MNC in India, that at a meeting uh, that he attended with the government, in some context the whole idea of innovation came up and uh, 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 the name Agastya came up and, and people were saying that, you know, Here's an example of an organization that has really become a center for innovation in education. And that was wonderful to hear. We're always looking for a new ideas, partnering with new organizations like the HP Catalyst Initiative. So, uh, you know, I look back and think, I quit my job, I was earning a lot of money in London, uh, money was no object, uh, never worried about how I was going to fund my daughter's education and all the rest of it. Uh, today things have changed somewhat and certainly financially a lot poorer than I used to be, though I'm not poor, but a lot poorer. Uh, but emotionally, intellectually, yes, even spiritually, I feel a lot richer. There's a huge sense of satisfaction, satisfaction of being part of a team that really came together to create something interesting, new, and hopefully valuable. So that's the story, Jim, and uh, I'd love to throw it over. Fantastic. The Thanks, Ramji. You know, I, I think you're, um, you're even understating the impact that Agassi is having. If I remember from talking to Ajit, who's you know, been leading one of our Catalyst Consortia, um, uh, last, to last take, I think you're impacting about 3 million students a year. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's uh, difficult to count, but that's about it, yes. Sometimes it's, it's a million, million and a half, three. Uh, because we've launched a new program at the village level. We have these village night community schools. So that has really recently increased the, uh, uh, the number of children that we... That and, and the remarkable yeah. story so to me about Agassi is that, you know, the, the education challenges throughout India are so intractable and the scale of the problem is so huge that having um, the uh, informal science sector uh, supporting the formal science learning of students uh, is, is such a, a brilliant model and, um, and it's really taken root. I mean, if, if ever I were to think of a good example of the uh, informal science NGOs working with formal education to great effect. I always point first to Agastya. So congratulations. I think it's just fantastic work, what you're doing. Thank you. Well, let's see. Uh, we, have, uh, we have time for some questions. Film, Jim. Would, would, would you like, it's, it's a three-minute film. Would people be interested in seeing that? Oh, uh, y yes. If it's, um, is Thank it? Yeah, let's, okay, see. Let's, let's see if we can get the film on. Okay, um, put the, if you could, put the, uh, um, the URL in the uh, chat, and then I'll paste it into the room as well, and we can see if we can get it to play for people. So, uh, Hi, I'll, I'll, let, me, let, me, let me direct you to the right place. It's pretty easy. There's a button right above your slide. Um, that, that looks like a globe with, on top of a piece of paper or something. There you go. And just paste the link in there. And, um, and that also paste it into the chat for people, too. Thanks. So, so what will happen is once you paste it into the, the room, everyone can play it individually on their browser. And then we'll all come back in a, in a minute. But it may take a while to spin up here. And while it's getting ready, uh, if there's more questions that people want to put in the chat window, I think there was a question early on here. Um, oh, uh, Lucy asked the question about uh, electricity. And are the labs that you're bringing out to rural schools in India, do they depend on uh, electricity and such? Yes, very much. Uh, and, and this is a problem. 
this is a problem, uh, uh, you know, the village, village schools and villages don't get continuous supply of electricity. Big problem. So mm -hmm. these nice community visits, uh, what we do is we, we carry solar lamps in our mobile labs. And if there's electricity, great. If not, we have to use our solar lamps. But it is a problem. Yes. Uh, Vinita, if you could put the URL in the chat, then people can link, uh, click on it directly, too. That, that's an alternative way than using the, um, the web tour function. Vinita, have you put the URL in the chat? Oh, is this it here? OK. Yeah, here's, a, yeah. here's a YouTube URL. Yeah. You know, Is, is it this one that, uh, that YouTube one that's in the chat there? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let me uh, paste it in here and see if I can get it to work um, as well. But um, there we go. And so if it doesn't start automatically for people. Southern states of No. Uh, it looks like it's having a challenge. I, I would highly recommend that everyone take a listen to that um, to it um, after the after the meeting. It doesn't look like it's playing through the tool right now. But it's a, I, I've seen it, Ramji, and yeah, it's a great it's a great film. Okay, no no problem. Um, so are there other questions um, from those of you in the room? You can um, raise your hand. We can give you audio control, or you can ask by uh, typing. Let me scroll through here to see if there's any other questions we missed. And Ramji, while we're waiting for questions, you know, if I remember correctly, you you told me once that um, the challenge it, it's it's hard for people to imagine what the, what the challenge really looks like unless you've been there. And you were describing to me that uh, the schools, but these buses, the mobile labs, go out to visit. They're in rural parts of the uh, countryside, um, and these are schools that often the teachers don't even show up, and and so these these are the I mean to say the schools are underserved is almost an understatement. Um, is that correct? Is that the kind of context we should? Yeah, I think uh, Jen, you're probably right on the whole. Uh, you know, the problem is that there is certainly a, a teachers are tasked to do many many things uh, besides uh, teaching. There's a lot of administrative responsibilities that they get engaged in with the government, whether they like it or not. So even if they're there to teach, they may not have all the time to teach. They may have to spend, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 percent of their time doing other administrative chores for the government. That's one. The second is there aren't enough teachers. So you have the same teacher teaching biology and language and math and so on. And uh, so, you know, there's a dilution, a significant dilution in quality. So not enough teachers. So uh, these are problems that uh, one has to live with. And this is where, you know, an organization like us can fill a gap. This is where the Young Instructor Leader uh, program does help to fill a gap. But it's, it's a huge challenge. Sometimes our mobile lab goes to a school and uh, the classroom will be filled with Two, three, four hundred kids. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. So, how do you how do you uh, teach effectively, engage large numbers of children? And you can't say, look, you know, the class today is restricted to thirty or forty or fifty kids, because uh, the school will say that, you know, what about the rest of the children? They also need exposure to this. And the mobile lab's going away, and it's really exciting. And everyone needs to get uh, uh, a piece of the action. So dealing with large numbers of children, uh, dealing in, with situations where there's no electricity, uh, and God knows it does get pretty hot and dusty in the villages in, uh, in India, most parts of India. And uh, so you need people 
people with what I call the BEE degree, and it doesn't stand for Bachelor of Electrical Engineering, but Bachelor of Energy and Enthusiasm. <laughs> Right? So without that, uh, it's not going to work. And you've got to be prepared to travel day in, day out, a new school every day possibly. Is there, there one of the questions here, is there a way for, um, uh, well, certainly getting support from other organizations would be great. How about um, our, at a individual level or teachers and whatnot, is there a collaboration? Is there something we all can do to help? A collaboration with the teachers? I'm just wondering, what, what kind of uh, support from around the world might be useful? Yeah, either from teachers, individuals, or other organizations? Yeah, uh, it can be very useful. You know, we're always looking for new delivery platforms, new teaching learning methods, new technologies, uh, better improved content. Uh, so these are some of the, uh, the non-financial types of support that we are looking for. You know, we've got this program now going with uh, uh, called the iMobile Lab that Ajit must have talked to you about, where we're blending access to the internet with our own hands-on science education. And that has also proved to be very effective. And we're thinking of launching a new mobile lab called BioHarmony on Wheels. So we're always looking for new content, uh, content that is less theoretical in the sense that it should be more related to day-to-day uh, -day life, things that people can apply and relate to their own daily lives. So we're looking constantly for content, new delivery platforms. Uh, we had this teacher come from the Trinity School in New York. He made two or three visits to our campus. He introduced kinesthetic learning. Uh, he talked about the uniqueness of our campus. He said, you know, Ramji, you've got something here that I haven't got. At least two things. One is, uh, you've got a senior management here that's actually uh, encouraging people to do, come up with new ways of learning and teaching. That's one. You're willing to experiment. The second thing is, you've got this campus, which is really a natural laboratory. And we can go from the classroom to nature and back and forth, and that makes the learning all the more powerful. And he, he introduced a lot of different ways of how this can be done very effectively. So we're looking for people like that, you know, mavericks, people with great ideas. Uh, they don't have to come to India, but if they could, all the better. But with today's modern technology, uh, you know, a lot of this can be done even remotely. Fantastic. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, if anyone's interested in being, I, 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 if I understand correctly, you've hosted visiting teachers and visiting scientists and gotten them involved uh, locally and, and yes. remotely. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think I think uh, Lucy wants to come visit if I'm reading the uh, the, the stream of messages here. <laughs> so. I see a question here. Uh, Benita, I do some work for a company in the U.S. called Edmodo. Two of my colleagues there are from India, and they're wonderful. I'm going to put them in touch with you. Great. Look forward to that. Fantastic. And um, let's see. Oh, let's see. Lucy's asking a question here. If people wanted to duplicate what you're doing in other countries, uh, where would they get started? Now, are there materials on your website that describe the model that they could replicate from? We have materials. I don't think we've put it up on our website. We could do that. But we certainly have materials. We're talking to a few countries in Africa. Uh, we've had visitors from the U.S. In fact, a friend of mine wanted to launch this mobile lab in, in the Maryland area. And uh, yeah, we've got materials and we'd be happy to share that uh, to see how we could adapt, adopt this program in other countries. Yes. And I, yeah, and I remember uh, Agassi has even traveled to South Africa, and the uh, the idea of a mobile lab is being tested in the um, uh, University of Fort Hare, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I remember, you know, about two years ago, I spoke at the Education World Forum in London, and uh, 
a gentleman in the audience uh, who looked like an Indian asked me a question and said, uh, he said, look, you know, I've never heard anything so innovative. I think you've given me the idea of how I can reach uh, children who, who are not today being reached with very high quality, interesting ways of learning. And it turned out he was the education minister of a very important province in Pakistan. <laughs> And uh, he invited me to Pakistan, and I said, you know, I'd be delighted to come, but would I be safe? And he said, don't worry, I'm also in charge of uh, uh, security. <laughs> so, you know, I'll make sure you have enough bodyguards to show you around. So, there's a lot of interest. The question is, you know, how does one export this model and get people to actually try it out? Yes. Sure. And how do we clone Ramji? That's another project. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say your your passion is inspiring and it's uh, it's infectious. So maybe that's that's the best way of cloning you. Any other questions from the uh, from the audience here? I don't see any hands. I don't see any uh, in the text yet. So, Rambi, what's the next? Big step for Agastya. What's the what's the what's what do you have in your sites next? That um, it's, that's the next well, big. Well, we have a ten-year plan, Jim, and we've looked at yeah. So one is building out this ecosystem in Karnataka. Is certainly a, a current uh, uh, preoccupation with the senior management of Agastya. So we're going to have to do that the next twelve to fifteen months. We also have a plan of. Uh, uh, doing a lot more of what we're doing, that is doing more of it. So going to state governments and uh, persuading them to sign up for the mobile lab and science center program. Uh, one thing that I think could be huge is this, what we call Operation Vasanta. And Vasanta is the name of a village kid. So we named it after her. I saw her one evening in a village teaching a couple of other kids using Agastya materials. So it struck me that if we could find in every village a Vasanta type of individual and motivate her or him to be our night school teacher, then, you know, we would have actually sort of uh, made the last mile. And uh, we're doing it now in about 87, nearing 100 villages in uh, two states. And I'd like to see this expand to maybe a thousand or ten thousand villages over the next ten years. So if we can do that, I think uh, that could also have a very huge positive impact at the uh, last mile village level. So that is something uh, that, that is a dream. Uh, we would love to create a couple more campuses. We're doing that uh, in Karnataka. We're building another creativity lab that we'd like to see perhaps three more of them in the west, north, and east of India. And uh, that's about the time, you know, I think I'll come up for retirement. <laughs> well, Ramji, I have a sneaking suspicion that um, you'll never be thoroughly retired. <laughs> Your passion will carry you all the way. Well, thank you very much, Ramji. Thank you, Jim. Uh, well, thank you. And fantastic work. Um, I'll remind everyone, too, to... Uh, to like you in Facebook, I, I put the link in there as well if you'd like to stay in touch with what Agastya is doing. Um, and Ramji, thank you very much for taking the time in your morning there to join us. Um, and we'll certainly uh, do all we can to help uh, share your story. So thanks for uh, sharing it with us, and we'll be in touch. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, always a pleasure to work with you guys and uh, and share whatever a few insights that you know we we had a guest there have come up with. Great. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So long. Bye.